actually, we creep up this curve to, at a certain level of stress, we're actually performing quite well. This is sort of the peak of, of the curve here. And then as you get more and more stress, as conditions start to, things start to deteriorate until you're back here and completely unable to function. But to mild to moderate levels of stress can have positive effects on performance. So, there are also sex differences in this. Um, research has demonstrated that, on average, females might not react and have a strong stress response to an acute stressor. That's been demonstrated. But also there are sex differences in cognitive effects. Research, for instance, has demonstrated that in tasks requiring, as I mentioned, um, memory or consult tasks requiring long-term memory consolidation, mild to moderate levels of stress can improve, increase performance in males but not in females. So there's a potential sex difference in this. So there are limitations to how we can perform research and navigation. For instance, um, it's really pretty easy in animals. They're small. We can take a rat, build a very complex maze, manipulate environmental cues, a lot of control. But in humans, it's really difficult to build mazes large enough. <laughs> so we have to think of other ways of doing this. Some researchers have used maps, have people read maps. Now, map reading is related to navigational behavior, but I don't think one could exactly say it is navigational behavior, for there's no movement through a physical environment. So we could build giant mazes, as I said, but it's not really very efficient. So, enter computers. Now, computers have become very <coughs> powerful. They have the capability of rendering complex three-dimensional environments. We can design an environment and manipulate variables. We can add a building, we can take away a building, we can move the position of the sky. We can also do um, all sorts of data collection. We can monitor exactly what a person is doing at every moment in the environment, which is something that one would really be unable to do with a giant maze, per se. It would be very difficult to move the sun or add a building, take it away. So, for example, the current study. This is what participants in my study saw. Participants were on the ground in what is essentially a virtual college campus. Here it is from above. You can see the entire thing. You can see we've got some dorm buildings. We've got by hall. We have a parking lot, a track. Participants in this environment, they, had, they were set down about here. And their task was to find a goal, which is a big white box, which was set down between these two buildings there. Um, so in a task such as mine, um, we have, I had to familiarize people with the environment. For several trials, they were given discrete on-screen instructions that guided them along a path, sort of a wandering path through the environment so that they would gain familiarity with the environment. They did this several times. And then participants were told, well, actually, that path is not the best path. Try and find the best path to the goal. And then we were able to monitor how well individuals did in finding the box. And then we had people do that twice, actually. So, methods. There were four groups. We had a stress group and a non-stress control group. We also, people, we considered male versus female. Participants were 68 Middlebury undergraduates, 28 men, 40 women. And then we approximately split them half and half into the stress and non-stress groups. My primary measures were path length. So in that environment, I tracked them as they moved around, and we could tell how long the path was that they were taking. And so a shorter path would mean better performance, would mean they were doing better in, in the task. We also monitored blood pressure to monitor physiological arousal to tell if people were getting stressed or not. And then finally, we asked them to rate, within a much larger survey, how stressed they felt, both when they first started the task and then after they completed the computer task, which was the navigation ta task. So here's the general outline of my study. Baseline vocabulary, they did a vocabulary test, and they did a math task, and VR navigation task. This area in here was when the main stress was applied. So in the stress group, participants filled out background surveys. They just sort of sat, had their blood pressure monitored for baseline level. Then participants were informed that they would be filmed. The camera was set up right in their faces. They were then asked to, told that their performance would be judged based on a comparison with everyone else in the study. They were also told that um, they were they're also informed of various things in the following tasks. For instance, they did a very difficult vocabulary task in which they were told they had seven minutes, and they were reminded of how much time they had left every minute. <laughs> <laughs> and then they had to do this. They had to stare directly into the camera with the light in their eyes, sort of like me with this projector, <laughs> and subtract 13 from a large four-digit number as quickly as possible, because they only had five minutes and their performance was being judged. But if they made a mistake, they had to start over. Very stressful. <laughs> and then they had to navigate, do the task I described earlier, go and find the white box. But they were told that if they didn't find the white box before their allotted time ran out, they would fail. <laughs> <laughs> In the non-stress group, it was a lot more fun. They filled out the background surveys. There was no camera running. There was a time limit, the same amount of time
reminded, they were not reminded of this at any point, they just did the task. They then sat quietly in the chair and counted up by two. <laughs> and then they performed the same, com the same task. Now the difference here is that while in this group they were told to complete the task as quickly as possible by following the most efficient possible path, or you will fail, here they were just told to try and take the most efficient path that you can. So they were still being told to take an efficient path, but it wasn't being, they were, it wasn't used as a stressor. So my main hypothesis will cover very quickly. VR path length, based on the literature, um, this is our performance, measure of performance in the task, the navigation task. There will be a slight male advantage, possibly, or maybe to no difference. However, for the mild to moderate stress effect, we predict that there will be a performance in the mild to moderate stress condition, and there might also be a possible difference in effects of stress on males and females. So results. First of all, the stressor really worked. We can just orient you quickly here. This is the this is here, this is the baseline period while they were doing the, the just filling out surveys and sitting quietly. And this is while they were doing the computer task. We can see this the green bars are the non-stress group, orange bars are the stress group, and then this is millimeters of mercury here. So we can see that there was a significant um, that people who were doing the computer task in the stress group had significantly higher blood pressure, both significantly higher than while well, they're during their own baseline period, and then from the people in the non-stress group performing the computer task. This is also the same is true for individuals who are asked to rate how stressed do you feel? And we can see that people in the stress group felt significantly more stress after they completed the computer task. So now the results. We found a significant interaction of stress by sex. Males chose significantly shorter paths than women, but only in the stress condition. So here we grouped it slightly differently. Now this is the entire non-stress control group, and this is the stress group. Blue bars are male, red bars are females. And we can see here, this is the path length. Now path length is a um, just an arbitrary unit of measure within my environment, um, but it is a measure of performance then. So what we see here is that while there was no significant difference in performance between males and females in the non-stress group, in the stress group, males were significantly, performed significantly better than females, and they performed significantly better than non-stressed males. So to give you an idea of what this means, this is an example of a short path. This is about as well as you possibly can do. They, this individual went directly to the goal. If you think of that environment, they went directly to those two buildings and came back. So those are people, you can see here that males in the stress group are doing almost as well as it's possible to do. But, this is an example of a long path, <laughs> and this is the normal behavior for individuals who did not do well. These are the participants that are making these bars so high. So, just to reiterate quickly, the best performing group was males under stress. They performed better than males in the control group, and better than females under stress as well. So the research project itself is ongoing. Um, there's a large body of, of data that we've collected regarding behavioral measures. How did people go about completing the task? What strategies did they use to try and complete the task? We will be analyzing that data in the coming weeks. Also, the project itself will continue through the next year. We're going to enlarge our N, as in more participants. Future studies, though, <laughs> it would be very interesting to see what happens if we increase levels of stress even more. Is there really a U-shaped effect occurring here? If we continue to increase stress, will males continue to get better and then get much worse? Possibly. Also, potentially, if we were to stress females more, would we start to see the N-shaped, the, the U-shaped effect there? The N-shaped effect. The U-shaped effect there. Would females start to get better, or would they keep getting worse? Because there's a tiny, tiny trend towards decrease in performance in females between for, from stress to non, from non-stress to stress. Uh, but it was very, very small. So, and also a more immersive virtual reality task, in that I was having our participants navigate with a joystick through it, this sort of, you saw the environment, not incredibly realistic, so if I want to be able to extend my application of my findings more directly to that original driving task I described, where, particip where you're driving under stress, um, it would be nice to use a really immersive driving simulator. These are really expensive and really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I would also love to use neural imaging to see exactly what um, brain areas are individuals using, which will actually tie in with the later work I will be doing on the behavioral aspect of this. So I want to thank everybody who has put up with me for the past year <laughs> <laughs> talking about this and thank all my advisors, all my friends, and, and the, the actually 72 people who did this study for me. And actually, I didn't put down the undergraduate research office that everyone's been citing. They gave me money to do this. So, <laughs> questions? <laughs> Same percent change in that they all increase the same amount. Um, yes. Um, okay.
did, I had a, people filled out a survey that looked at video game experience. Males, unsurprisingly, had significantly more video game experience. <laughs> However, when we covariated it with this, there was no significant covariance. Yeah. We're going to go back and look at that again and see if there's some other factors that are coming into play. It's a little surprising that there's no covariance, but there wasn't. So, yes. <laughs> oh, okay, there we go. Right there. Yes. Uh, one of the ways that you induce stress was to sort of highlight the fact that people's performance was going to be uh, mm -hmm. monitored. Do you think that changed their motivation as well as their stress level? So, 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 so made them feel like they needed to do better? The that? social facilitation theory that we're getting at? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a slight threat of that. Participants did rate themselves as significantly more competitive mm -hmm. in the stress group. Um, the In both groups, though, participants were being observed. I sat right there with them to sort of try and mitigate that to a certain extent. Um, so that means that everyone was being, was very aware of the fact that I was sitting there watching them. So, you know, we try to control for it, but the idea of having your performance judged was kind of important to the stressor, so, yes. Did any of the participants express confusion over the term, uh, or, or the term you use, the most efficient path length? Mm. Um, or did you tell them the shortest path? I said I most. Was, I was interested in the, why, which term you told them. Right. By that point, they had gone through the environment following this very loopy pattern twice. So when I told them that it wasn't the best, I said, this was not the best path. They were like, yes. Well, actually, there were two groups. The people that then took the short path directly to the goal afterwards were like, well, duh. People in the other group that got lost were like, really? <laughs> but they got it. And you would see that in the other in the really group, they would like follow some of the instructions and then get lost and then come back and find a landmark and start from there again. So they understood what I meant.
ask, I was very clear, I never said the words, um, na I never said navigation, I never said spatial, I never said spatial cognition. I told them I would like you to complete some tasks where you will be, um, where we will be looking at visual information processing. Um, so the next one, I just said, I want you to just move through this, the computer generated environment. Um, when they did this JLAP thing, I said, it was the last thing I did, I just handed it to them and said, could you just do one more task before you're done? So I tried to control for stereotype threat as much as I could. I mean, obviously, it's, it's always potentially present, but um, I, I don't think that was a main concern. So, yes, sir, Mr. Watts. Uh, I mentioned she's been part of the stress situation. Yes. <laughs> what do you think the effect of a non cognitive stress situation might be ambient temperature? Right. Now, originally, I was going to use um, the cold presser task, which is a physiological stressor. Now, the thing is that I needed a stressor that could produce um, a continuous physiological arousal during the task itself. So this was, a very this was a major part of my design period, was to develop a stressor that would try and model that real-world experience of being under stress while you're doing what you're doing. Um, but as you say, room ambient temperature. <laughs> There's some other things you can throw on, like annoying, like making the environment really unpleasant. We played around with that a little bit. But the idea of making the task itself, as in the computer task, um, as involved with the stressor as possible was really important to me. And then mental math just works so well. It just works really, really well. So I don't know if I answered your question well or not, but... Okay.